<clears throat> okay, it is 101, so I will get started now. Um, this is Brady O'Leary, and it, this will be a webinar uh, entitled uh, My Lagoon Has a Ammonia Limit. Now what? What do I do? Uh, we see this happening all over the country uh, where regulators are imposing uh, new limits on every wastewater facility, including, including wastewater lagoons. And uh, we'll learn about why ammonia limits can be a particular challenge for lagoons themselves. Um, so I'll start this off with a story of uh, bacteria, right? So, <coughs> excuse me, um, wastewater treatment is all about bacteria. You know, if you go to a party and you talk to people, they'll, they'll think wastewater treatment is chemicals and filters. Um, but we all know, I, I would imagine, everybody on this call knows that the real workhorse of uh, treatment is bacteria. We don't treat the water, we just keep bacteria happy and may treat the water. This is somewhat of a story about how uh, bacteria works when it's treated well or when it has conditions that it likes and um, a story about what happens when it has conditions it does not like. So uh, the reason that your lagoon is challenged from a nitrification standpoint is the bacteria simply aren't happy. Um, so what if we do make them happy? And the story or I guess the, the scenario is uh, let's give bacteria, we'll say heterotrophic bacteria, uh, the perfect conditions, all the air it needs, all the food it needs. In fact, that food is going to be cream cheese because bacteria, heterotrophs love cream cheese and it gobbled up real quick. Um, and let's imagine the entire earth is cream cheese. So this car is cream cheese, this, this, this little uh, reactor right here is cream cheese. And I drop one literal heterotrophic bacteria on the HVAC exhaust right here. It divides and eats and divides and eats. Uh, eats, the, eats the stack there, eats the building, starts eating through the earth. Um, with optimized conditions, these bacteria are happy. And I guess the laws of physics are uh, not holding true because the entire earth is cream cheese. Uh, how long does it take? I'm curious if anybody can, can get this in their head. How long does it take for the entire earth to be consumed? And I usually get answers that are, uh, you know, months, years, whatever. Uh, the Actual time is 72 hours. And in the last half an hour, or I believe last hour, half of the earth disappears. So this is equal parts a story about the law of exponential numbers as it is uh, a bacteria digestion. But when these bacteria are given the right situation, they can really kick butt. And uh, we're gonna apply that to nitrification or ammonia removal here today. Uh, so a bit of an overview here. Uh, we're gonna start with an introduction, uh, who I am, who, who Triple point environmental is uh, why uh, what we say has a, a little bit, we have a little bit of experience in this sort of thing. Um, and then we're going to review the nitrification process and discuss the seven reasons uh, why your lagoon doesn't nitrify. I have six crossed out because our flyer said six, but I was doing this and I got inspired and I added, I added a second one or a seventh one. Uh, so we're doing seven today. Um, and then to answer the question, you've got a limit. What now? Now what? What do I do? Um, I think it starts by studying up on nitrification, understanding your limits, and then at that point, evaluate your options. Uh, and I just put this photo here. That's me, your presenter, um, uh, joyfully rolling across a industrial sugar beet lagoon. Uh, didn't smell too good, but I've been around a whole bunch of lagoons in on, fortunately not actually in yet, but that's kind of a badge that every lagoon person eventually uh, gets. I'm just hoping to hold that off. Uh, so Triple Point here, uh, the company that uh, I'm with, is has been around since uh, the late 2000s. Uh, and what we do is lagoon process exclusively. We actually have this phrase that lagoons do it better. And if you're on this webinar, you know what that is. You've seen it, I'm sure, a dozen times. But we genuinely believe that lagoons are the best choice for small towns. Um, they're easy to operate. They're reliable. They're robust. And oftentimes, the infrastructure is already there. So let's use what you have. Um, we also believe that lagoons can do it better when they're faced with new challenges, new regulation, kind of like what we're talking about today. Um, the other things aren't as important uh, for this call, but to go through them, uh, we have a tailored process in that the first solution that we offer typically isn't the final solution we end up with. And that's because every single lagoon is custom. So there's no one solution, one perfect solution for every lagoon. We have to understand what the customer's needs are or what the engineer's needs are or what the design needs are um, and it's usually it's an iterative process so we tailor fit every system to every lagoon and then we back it up now we have a saying which is written on our wall we say it we do it um, and we essentially guarantee if we say it's going to do something uh, we we back that up and we, we do guarantee it you may have seen in other webinars we 
as a company did make the Inc. 5000 list. We're super excited about that. It's just the uh, 5,000 fastest growing uh, companies in 2019. Uh, we're the ninth fastest environmental company uh, from a growth standpoint. So really pumped about that and we'll put that away here. Um, and from a process standpoint, we like to get involved in wastewater after uh, headworks and before disinfection. So that could be aeration, that could be nitrogen removal or uh, just uh, ammonia removal here, it could be phosphorus removal, baffles, blowers, liners, you name it. But uh, uh, we, we, we like to cover the, the gambit there. So let's get to it. Uh, let's cover nitrification basics. This stuff is a little academic, but uh, it's I think it's really important to understanding the bigger picture here. And the first and most obvious one is what is ammonia? Um, ammonia is a, is a combination of nitrogen and hydrogen. It usually comes in the form, well, it does come in the form of NH3 ammonia or NH4 ammonium. Um, it is a colorless gas, but if anybody here has a cat or deals with ammonia in other ways, uh, you know the smell of ammonia. It's got a very putrid smell. Um, and moving on, so ammonia is a component of nitrogen overall. So for all intents and purposes, we have ammonia, ammonium. We'll just call that ammonia for now. That's how we treat it. And when we break those down, we'll learn that we first convert it to nitrite and then nitrate. These are other forms of nitrogen. And the last form of nitrogen is organic nitrogen. And this is nitrogen bound up in the cell walls of living things and proteins. Um, it's usually pretty low in municipal streams, but you will find industrial streams can have high organic nitrogen. So all these together are TN or total nitrogen. Left side of the screen, this is TKN, if you have a limit, <coughs> it says TKN, that is total Keldahl nitrogen. Excuse me. And then the top four on the screen is our total inorganic nitrogen or TIN. This is what we like to focus on um, for, is because from a biological standpoint, TIN, total inorganic nitrogen, is what we can treat. We can treat everything up here. The organic nitrogen is difficult because it's bound up with other things or it's protected in the cell walls of living things like algae, and algae does not want to be digested. It protects itself. So it's difficult to get at that nitrogen. TIN limits, in our opinion, are the easiest to hit. So why do we treat ammonia? Why is it important? Why do we care? Um, the first uh, and most obvious one is uh, ammonia is toxic to fish. I'm sure many of you operators out there had to do a wet test where you put a whole bunch of fish in a bucket and you, you find out, does my water kill these fish? Um, high ammonia will kill these fish. Um, it's also dangerous to crustaceans uh, and other amphibians. So if unchecked, it really will uh, screw with fish populations in rivers and streams where they have high ammonia concentrations. But it's a bit bigger than that. Um, so the ammonia leaving your plant doesn't just leave your plant and disappear. It goes into a stream or a river and then a bigger river. And these all, all these rivers tend to go to the same place. They're part of the same watershed. Uh, and one of the biggest ones in the United States is the Mississippi watershed covering almost half of the country. So all the water from all of these cities here travels to one location, one outlet in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, farms also go there. And these are the two biggest uh, contributors to the pollution problem you see down here. Um, the difficulty here, and I know a lot of people are, you know, we're regulating all these small towns, but why aren't we regulating the farms? The challenge is we can test the water coming out of a wastewater facility. It is point source pollution, right? I can see it, I can test it, and I can know what's coming out of there. Testing farms is ambiguous. It runs off everywhere, and it's difficult to do. Um, so for now, we're just going to treat what we know, and we're the wastewater people, so we're going to treat wastewater facilities. And the other reason this problem is so, uh, I guess, concentrated is that if you remember, let me get this here. Yeah, there, this is where most of the lagoons are in the country in the Midwest, and this coincides pretty directly with the Mississippi watershed. So other watersheds are affected, but the Mississippi is by far the most affected. And the dead zone is what we create. Now, what happens is the pollution, the ammonia, everything else, but we're going to focus on the ammonia. It's a nutrient. Um, and the nutrient travels out and is consumed by growing algae. And it creates a situation called eutrophication. Um, eutrophication, I think, is a Greek word that means overfed. Uh, so 
there's so much food out there that they can grow so much algae that the algae actually start killing themselves because they die um, and then they start to decay. Again, this huge mass of algae decays, sucks all of the, the oxygen out of the water. In addition to the algae dying, everything else around there dies. So this area will have a DO of water in the zero to two milligrams a liter range. And if you're a fish, you want five, six, seven milligrams a liter DO. So there's essentially no living life in this red area. It is massive. Um, and I was reading yesterday that it is the, or at least last year, was the largest it's been in, in the past 30 years. So if you're a shrimp farmer out of New Orleans and you want to catch some shrimp, you've got to get in a boat and travel 80 miles outside of this range to find the shrimp. Here's a diver working on probably an oil rig in the Gulf there. So you can see how much algae can be grown. Um, but it's difficult to really quantify what this problem is, right? And early on, I tried to figure out how do I understand this better? So, you know, I don't know how much all this algae is, but what I do know is uh, how, how I, can, I can picture another a plant, for example. Like we all know corn in America. There's tons of corn grown everywhere. So I said, if we took all of the ammonia we're contributing to the Gulf of Mexico and didn't grow algae, we grew corn, how much corn is that? Um, so the 300,000 pounds of ammonia would grow 145 million tons of corn. And that's not the husks, that's not the stalk, that is just the corn cobs themselves. Um, and then again, I'm like, well, I don't know what the heck 145 million tons of corn looks like. So I did some math and it, you could put them in those corn cobs, put them in train cars, and that train would circle the globe twice. Um, so it gives you an idea of how much algae we're, we're, we're growing down in the Gulf of Mexico and why we're all caring about ammonia. So we want to limit it, right? We want to treat it. How do we do it? And we do it with a process, a biological process called nitrification. Uh, and nitrification is a process where ammonia or ammonium is converted to nitrite and then to nitrate. Uh, and this is done with a very specific kind of bacteria called nitrifiers, uh, primarily nitrosomonas and nitrobacter. And this story is kind of a tale of two different bacteria. Uh, most of the bacteria that you've been used to, uh, what many people have been used to at least, uh, is the heterotrophs in the wastewater lagoon system. These are over here. These are kind of the BOD eating bacteria, super robust. These are why lagoons are very reliable. It's because these bacteria, they grow fast, they eat fast, they consume fast, or, or they uh, multiply fast. Um, they're fantastic. So I kind of liken these to tiny little terminators. If they want something, they're gonna get it. They don't really care how much DO is out there. As long as there's a, some air somewhere, some oxygen somewhere, they're, they're gonna get it. As long as there's food somewhere, they're going to get it. Um, the bacteria that eat the ammonia are different. They don't fix their carbon or get their carbon out of the food they eat. They get their carbon out of the air. So they're super specialized and they instead eat ammonia. So in that they're specialized, they're extremely fickle. They grow very slow. They don't compete very well. They have a whole bunch of needs that the BOD eating bacteria don't have. And these bacteria are why your lagoon does not nitrify very well, is it was never designed to cater to nitrifiers. Um, so if these are the tiny little terminators, uh, these are the princess and the pea. And if one thing isn't working right, they're not gonna work right. And if uh, you know a couple of conditions aren't in their favor, they're just not gonna work at all. So we're gonna look at what those factors are. And we have seven key factors for nitrification. And when we're going over these, I want you to think about um, how I can apply these to my unique situation, whether you're an engineer, you're a regulator that's helping a town, or you're an operator. Um, how do I optimize these conditions in my application to get the results that I want? Um, in a lot of cases, operators can modify a lagoon system to, to give them a chance of nitrification today. Uh, you don't need a ton of extra equipment uh, necessarily, sometimes you do, um, because small changes in your lagoon can yield nitrification. Uh, but for tight limits or for year-round uh, treatment, equipment might be necessary. So if I need a separate solution, um, how do I evaluate these different solutions from my lagoon if I want a guaranteed nitrification so uh, solution? So the first factor I want to talk about is aeration. And this is very common to wastewater lagoon, uh, but nitrifiers want a lot of air. They consume a, a huge quantity of oxygen. So people are used to, I want to load 1.5 pounds of oxygen for every pound of BOD. Um, that's what the heterotrophs want. The nitrifiers for every pound of ammonia want 4.6 pounds of oxygen. So they don't want to work hard. Uh, they, they need lots of air and then they don't want to work hard to get it. They want lots of DO. 
they want the DO to be four, five, six, even eight. The more, the better. Um, whereas the heterotroph don't really care. And even if there's no DO, they're going to rip it off a nitrate molecule anyway. So um, the ammonia wants lots of air and easy access to it. And then the mixing is essential with aeration as well, because you always want the bubble, the ammonia, and the bacteria uh, always in contact with each other. In a lot of cases, most lagoons weren't designed with ammonia air in mind. Uh, they were designed in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and if air wasn't applied, all this 4.6 pounds per pound of air wasn't applied, it's likely the lagoon currently does not have enough air to nitrify properly. And, and at the same time, a lot of lagoons aren't being operated at 4 to 8 DO all the time. Uh, the other factor is presence of BOD. So the heterotrophs, the little terminators, outcompete the nitrifiers. If I lock the terminator in the room with the princess and the pea and put, you know, one meal in there and they're both hungry, which one do you guys think uh, is going to actually get the food, right? You know, when the princess and the pea say, it's too far away and that meal's not big enough and uh, it's not warm enough and whatever else, you know, she's concerned about, terminator's probably crossed the room eating the food and probably eating the princess too. So, um, we need to get the terminators out of the equation. So what we want is low BOD before nitrification, nitrification can take place. Typically, we look for a spot in your lagoon at which point and after the BOD is 20 to 30 milligrams a liter. That means a lot of heterotrophs aren't going to grow, and there's not too much competition, and the nitrifiers can start to flourish. Uh, a nitrific nitrification factor, I believe this is number three, uh, is pH and alkalinity. Uh, these nitrifiers want a pretty neutral pH. Um, ideal range is 7.5 to 8. I've seen them work technically as low as 5.5, but academically it shouldn't go below 6.5 to 9 for good nitrification. Um, and also alkalinity is key. When these nitrifiers consume, they uh, also consume alkalinity. And if there's not a lot of alkalinity in the water, and it consumes all the alkalinity, it will start to lower the pH of the water to the point where the nitrifi <coughs> nitrifiers can actually acidify the water and poison themselves. So uh, ensuring that you have alkalinity is also key. Nitrification fact, factor number four, uh, these numbers are off, is nitrifier mass. So this is another reason lagoons don't nitrify well, is we can't get enough of these bacteria out there. Um, they, they don't grow fast, they eat slow if you remember, but also they want to grow on stuff. They are not comfortable growing in the water column, they want to grow on walls and baffles and aerators, but the issue with a lagoon is that there's not a lot of stuff out there, right? You've got, it's designed to be one big volume. Um, so in that they eat slow, we can't get enough of them in a small space. So this is uh, DeSoto, Iowa, and we'll talk a bit more later about uh, nitrifier mass and how we improve that in this location. But the long story short is we want to get as much of them out there to get the ammonia treated. Uh, another nitr nitrification factor, and this is the biggest one in my opinion in wastewater lagoons, is temperature. Um, you'll see this is a graph of green is temperature, uh, blue is effluent from a wastewater lagoon system, and red is maybe that lagoon system's permit that's coming up. They had a permit and they're asking themselves, now what? Because every year as the temperature goes back down, the ammonia effluent goes back up. Nitrifiers want warm water. Uh, in a lagoon system, below 60, they're really slow. And uh, for all intents and purposes, below 50, they're not doing much. They're moving like molasses. And this, ha this is a big problem for wastewater lagoon systems in two thirds of the country because it does cool down. Uh, the the water you know down south can get uh, maybe into the 40s or 50s depending on location and way up north uh, you know your lagoons freeze so um, when the water gets that cold nitrification essentially stops and it's difficult to control because lagoons are enormous and it's it's tough to, to keep that heat in it's one big heat sink um, another nitrification factor and this is just kind of bug basics is you know, you have to be able to keep bacteria alive. This is a biological process. If you can't keep bugs alive, you're not gonna complete the process. So um, are there any biocides in the water, any heavy metals, any industrial cleaners? These primarily apply to industrial plants. Um, industrial cleaners could be quats. And, you know, a lot of times you ask what's, you know, what's in your water and people will say, I don't know. Um, we've had situations with biocides where uh, a town was receiving septage and that septage 
contains nice blue dye in the bottom of porta potties. And that blue dye is meant to kill bacteria. So you gotta, you gotta think what's going into my water and what's it doing to my bugs. Um, and lastly, the water needs to be homogenous, right? If you have a bug over here and, and ammonia over there, it's not going to nitrify. They have to be in contact at all times. They need oxygen and they need nutrients, they need food. Um, this is a uh, new one here. Uh, key, nitrif the key nitrification factor, number six, is sludge. Um, the sludge affects nitrification in a few ways. Uh, the first and most obvious is it takes up volume in the bottom of the pond. Um, and as it takes up volume, it decreases the retention time of the pond. Essentially, the water is moving through the pond faster and therefore treatment is decreased. Uh, but the big reason that sludge is, is an issue is that it can produce benthyl feedback. And that means sludge can produce ammonia. As sludge breaks down anaerobically, uh, it'll produce methane and hydrogen sulfide and also ammonia. So this is an industrial facility that we encountered and the blue numbers here across the process, influent here, effluent here, you see the ammonia coming in is 6.1, goes through a few things, bumps up to 11, 12, it's not going crazy. And then it jumps up pretty quickly to 22 and 28 and you can see in this case there's no aeration tested positive for h2s which means there's anaerobic activity but it started with six and they're coming out at 34 milligrams a liter so they don't have an ammonia problem they have an ammonia production problem so knowing what your sludge is doing and how much uh how much uh, anaerobic activity is happening is going to be critical to hitting your limits and this is the bonus this is the seventh one uh seventh nitrification factor it's flow um, so short circuiting is a super common problem in wastewater lagoons, and it is difficult to control exactly where the flow goes without a serious baffle regimen. So if you look here, this is a wastewater lagoon, and this is a dye test. We messed with the colors so you can see it, but the you see it mixes pretty well, really quick. But the dye shoots up. This is where the influent comes up, shooting from the bottom right here. If you ask yourself where should the effluent be in the situation, you'd say as far away as possible over here, over here. But in reality, the water comes up right here and the effluent pipe is right there. If you look where the green dye goes first, it is straight to the effluent pipe. Um, and if you can't hang on to your water, it's difficult to treat it um, as, as effectively as possible. And this is a problem, especially if, if low limits are, are applied to a, a limit or a, a permit. So as a bit of a recap here, why do lagoons nitrify, uh, fail to nitrify? Could be the presence of too much BOD, uh, but most lagoons can handle that. They can treat BOD very well. Could be low or high pH or low alkalinity. Most, at least municipal lagoons, have no problem with that. Or it could be the presence of toxins or other, or other um, issues like that. Those are typically not the reasons lagoons fail to nitrify. These are the, the reasons they, they fail, is that there's not enough bugs out there, not enough, not enough hungry mouths to eat the ammonia that's applied. Uh, the temperature is too cold. There might not be enough oxygen out there. Or the lagoon's not operated at four to eight DO. Uh, could be low mixing. The flow is not controlled. So maybe all of the water isn't being treated as intended. Um, or there could be sludge feeding back ammonia into the process. So you get a limit. Uh, you're, you're supplied, you're, you're told in 24 months, you have a compliance deadline. So it's important to understand what that limit means. Um, in a lot of cases, we highly encourage to talk to your regulator. They're there to help you. They have tons of experience. They know how other towns have accomplished this. Um, they want the same thing you do, and they want a good quality effluent. Um, also, rural water circuit riders are also uh, good people to talk to as well. So first, you want to evaluate your limit, right? How strict is it? Is it 10 milligrams a liter? That's not too bad. Is it 0.5 milligrams a liter or one milligram a liter? That could be pretty low, and that is pretty low. Um, another thing too, is it milligram per liter based or is it loading based? Because milligram per liter doesn't care if it's 5,000 gallons a day or 500,000 gallons a day, but loading based could be diluted. So if you're allowed five pounds per day of ammonia, that's different at 50 gallons per day versus 100 gallons per day from a milligram a liter standpoint. Um, also, what times of the year are, do you have a limit applied? When is it most strict? Oftentimes we see regulators understanding that lagoons have a harder time in the winter and allowing higher uh, effluent values in the winter time. And also the impact of ammonia in the winter on those streams is not as bad. Um, 
And oftentimes we see lower limits in the summer months, again, as low as, I think the lowest we've seen as a blanket nationwide is 0 0.5, 0 0.6 milligrams a liter. Um, also, can we change the discharge time? A lot of your lagoon systems out there are going to be intermittent discharge where they hang on to the water and choose when to discharge. So if you're evaluating what times of the year I have a limit, is it possible to discharge during a time when the limit might be more favorable for that discharge? Change your, your, your process there. Um, also, can we change discharge location? Now, if you are discharging to a, a impacted stream, you know, where there's a, a, a special fish that's endangered, um, your limits are probably going to be pretty low. But I've seen towns that are like maybe a mile away from a bigger stream, the same stream that the impacted stream might discharge into, and their options are to fix the ammonia in their lagoon or consider pumping the lagoon wastewater to the larger stream that's less impacted. And that larger stream typically would come with higher limits. Um, so you might not have to treat as low. And the other thing to take a look at is when is my compliance deadline? Um, oftentimes it's really far in the future. Regulators usually give a long runway for you to figure things out. Um, we also see a lot of towns waiting as long as possible because fixing the problem is tough. They know that lagoons aren't very good at it and oftentimes solutions can be expensive. So uh, keep the compliance deadline in mind. If you really wanna move fast municipally, we're still seeing most systems taking around two years to go from kind of ideation to implementation. So um, make sure to keep that in mind when planning when to hit the compliance deadline. Um, you wanna look at, can I meet my goals with my existing lagoon? Maybe you have a high limit and you're close to hitting your, your target and you've just learned that, oh, I need more aeration and my lagoon doesn't have aeration. That could be a good thing to try uh, to see if you can accomplish nitrification in the lagoon that you have today. And if not, the question is, how do we get there from here? You know, what do I have to add to my lagoon to accomplish this? And we're gonna go over a few different systems here. Um, but what I find is that all of these systems address most of these key factors, if not all of the nitrification key factors, they just do it in different ways. I kind of liken it to Taco Bell. I'm sure if, if I were to poll, what is the least likely uh, photo you expect in a wastewater presentation? Actually, it might not be Taco Bell, but uh, this is what you get, you get Taco Bell. I'm pretty sure Taco Bell has like six ingredients and they just layer them in different ways and different quantities to create different products. I don't know why we're duped by it. You know, is this a taco or is this a Crunchwrap Supreme? That's kind of just up to you. Um, this is the same thing happens with nitrification technologies. If they're going to work well, they're going to address those nitrification factors that we discussed and they just do it in different ways. Sometimes they might uh, do more aeration than another company or have more media than another company, but everyone's going to do it in the same way. This is the way that works, so this is the way you got to do it. So we're going to demonstrate that they're all kind of the same uh, it, with four common methods of nitrification in your lagoon. So we're going to talk about putting lagoon media inside the lagoon. Uh, there's the attached growth rock filter, the method where you cover a complete mix of lagoon, and lastly, a temperature regulated MBBR. So what are your options here? The first one we're going to look at is in lagoon media. And the idea here is we wanna put media in the lagoon that bacteria can grow on. These are essentially nitrifier condos um, and they're dropped into the lagoon, they're aerated from the bottom, so they have air and they have all the surface area they need. Um, the, typically these are placed in the lagoon after the sludge is settled. You don't want to set these in a sludgy area because as you can see, sludge can get up and around, clog them up. Um, and they also wait until the BOD is low in the lagoon. Lagoon upstream is typically designed to treat the BOD first. That way these can cater to the nitrifiers. Aerated at the bottom, and they do have a good nitrifier mass. Uh, we'll consider that a medium amount of surface area inside the lagoons. Um, the kind of Achilles heel of in lagoon media is that first of all, uh, you have a pod here and a pod there, but you can't guarantee that every drop of water is going to go through every one of these pods. Short circuiting will affect uh, in lagoon media. And second, these systems don't address temperature. Uh, they just kind of compensate for it. So you might have seen uh, fabric ones. This is actually one that Triple Point is designed where it's a uh, uh, corrugated media. There's the dome version. There's all sorts. Essentially, you put a whole bunch of them out there. And what happens is 
and here's actually an example of data from one of the facilities. The ammonia effluent was high it, throughout the year for the most part. They installed a media system right here. You can see the ammonia dropped. It did its job great through the, the summer months, but as it started getting colder, the ammonia crept up and jumped up again because this type of in-lagoon media, in really any sense, does not address temperature. So these are options for light limits. I just need a bit more nitrification or warm weather compliance. You're way down south, your water is always warm. This is a good way to chew up some ammonia in your lagoon. But we're gonna take a look at uh, more comprehensive options here. And these are options that are going to address all of the factors of nitrification, at least the, the really important ones in your wastewater lagoon. Um, and we're, we're comparing the three most successful technologies that we've seen out there. We actually did a survey of data across four years in, in one of the states that we're in. Um, so we can compare the effluent, this is third party data from the state, the effluent uh, compliance from these different systems. So we have cover and complete mix, we have temperature regulated MBBR, um, and we, this is what triple point does, and there's an aerated rock filter. And you can see we have a lot of data points from all of these, well over 300 over multiple facilities and we evaluated how compliant are these systems and uh, the first one is 87 percent mbbr is 98 percent rock filter is 96. Um, keep in mind this data is is, is kind of uh, longitudinal and is over multiple facilities and it does include bod tss and ammonia um, and we all know that perfection is impossible but we try to avoid excursions by any means necessary. So we consider all of these to be reliable technologies that do work very well. And then a lot of these excursions come down to operational uh, situations or uh, site specific situations. All of you know, these, the right two are given an A grade and this one gets a B or B plus for um, compliance. So all, these are all great technologies. The first one we're gonna talk about is the aerated rock filter. Uh, and the idea is you dig a big hole in the ground, you fill it with rock and the rock becomes media or attached growth sites for bacteria. Um, the bacteria grow all over these rocks and there are a lot of them. Um, so the kind of similar to the last situation, the sludge is settled out in the lagoon, the lagoon does all the digestion. It is aerated at the bottom so the bacteria have air. But one of the differences here is this is an external reactor. Um, the, the flow is controlled. Uh, so we want to guarantee or this technology wants to guarantee that every drop of water is treated and it does that by passing every drop of water through it. Um, the big differentiator of this technology is the nitrifier mass, you know, how much bacteria is grown out there and the temperature. Uh, the nitrifier mass is really, really high and that, that they, as you can see with all the rock out there, there's an awful lot of it, these are 10 feet deep. Um, and that's because the temperature is being compensated for. Uh, this technology acknowledges that lagoons get really cold if you get down to 1C, and the bacteria still work around there, but they are, again, moving like molasses. So in order to get the nitrification we need, we need to get a ton of bacteria out there. So the brute force approach is get a ton of bacteria out there. Um, and this technology does a good job of treating to low limits that you're going to see anywhere in the country. Uh, another philosophy in treatment, another way to kind of mix up the ingredients here is the cover and complete mix. And what this system does is it says, okay, the lagoons are going to lose temperature, so we're going to keep that temperature in. Uh, the wastewater coming in your influent in your lagoon is going to be between 50 and 60 degrees typically, so that, that water is warm and we can nitrify in warmer, warmer temperatures. So let's, they put a cover on the top and then they say, we want to treat this water as fast as possible because the faster we treat it, the warmer it stays because we have to get the BOD down first and then we need warm water to nitrify. So they'll, they'll treat the water fast and then put it through a polishing reactor an external reactor, just like the previous system, to control the flow and treat, ensure they treat all of the water, and then it goes on to discharge. So the big differentiators of this system is that the BOD is not just treated, digested in the lagoon, it is digested <coughs> with a complete mix uh, kinetic rate. That means there is uh, four to 10 times the aeration or mixing power in the lagoon that drives up the treatment kinetic rate and the BOD is digested faster and water's kept warmer. Um, the aeration is not just aerated, it's complete mix aeration. So usually eight to 12 SCFM per thousand cubic feet of volume. So a lot of horsepower there. And that's augmented with mechanical mixers to keep the lagoon churned up. 
Uh, the nitrifier mass in this application is high. Uh, the media that's put in the polishing reactor is actually, I should show you here, it's essentially this. Um, it is corrugated uh, trickling filter media where bacteria can grow on the, the loss of surface area. Um, and the temperature is not compensated for in this application. They're maintaining the temperature that's coming in. Um, and then we're going to talk about the MBBR, the temperature regulated MBBR. Um, this is what uh, triple point, this is what we do. Um, the ingredients are the same, and it's just implemented a little bit differently. Uh, so we'll do the same thing where we'll let the lagoon do what the lagoon was designed to do, and that's treat BOD and TSS through a couple of stage process. If it's not doing that, you know, you can always add aeration to boost the treatment with any technology that you choose. We'll pull the water out when it's mostly ammonia water and put it through a two-stage reactor process. Uh, about four hours per tank, so eight hours total. Because um, we optimize the treatment here, we can do it, we can do the nitrification very, very quickly. And then we discharge to a polishing cell and onto the final effluent. Now, with this system, what we know is that we can very reliably get uh, down, we can treat down to four degrees Celsius. Um, that's kind of the efficiency point. And below that point, nitrification becomes very unpredictable, unreliable. So we have two options. We can either manage the temperature in some way. At this point, the water is cold, so we would have to heat it up. Or we can compensate for temperature by making the system four, five, ten times bigger to deal with colder temperatures. And we crunched the numbers and we found that it is much more economical uh, from our perspective to uh, manage the temperature when you need it just for a couple months of the year instead of uh, compensating with a lot more capital equipment. So we have uh, pieces of media on the inside, uh, hundreds of thousands if not millions of these pieces of media, little bacteria condos that are tumbling around. Um, this is where we grow our nitrifiers. We keep them in the reactor. Uh, we keep the media in the reactor with screens and we have a coarse level aeration grid at the bottom and a cover at top. And we'll talk about a cover in a little bit. And here's a photo application of it. Aerated lagoon right here. This is DeSoto, Iowa, that spinning lagoon that I showed earlier. And these are the reactors right here. So applying the same kind of rubric to it, uh, the key factors of nitrification, um, the lagoon's doing the BOD treatment, the lagoon's doing the sludge settling, and uh, there is aeration inside the tank to provide the oxygen and DO for the bacteria. Uh, we're also doing an external reactor because we want to control the flow and treat every drop of water. Um, and what we're doing is we're really, really concentrating the nitrifier mass. I'll show you what these media look like here in a second. And the other thing is we're optimizing the temperature for the bacteria. We're kind of keeping them in their efficient or sweet spot range. So the bacteria are nitrifying really, really fast and very reliably. Um, so this R system we put in the ground, just like um, actually most of the other reactors are put in the ground because the ground has an insulation effect. Uh, and we also put a cover on it. Um, so instead of covering lagoon, we're just covering the area that we're heating right here. So it might be 10 by 10 or 20 by 20 uh, to hold the heat in. Uh, so we always get the question of, uh, are, we, are you going to maintain temperature? My lagoon, it might be 20 degrees below zero outside. What am I going to do about that? Um, and the ground's really insulated. The covers do a great job. Uh, we've both empirically tested in the field and crunched the numbers. If we have five degree water coming in and it's super cold outside, negative 20, 20 degree Fahrenheit, um, we only lose 0.3 degree across each tank. Uh, so it's really low heat loss and it's still kept in the sweet spot range. We cover with covers um, similar to the lagoon covers that you saw. And then the aerated rock filter typically cover with crushed, um, crushed tires or mulch. So they are insulated from the outside air. So I was talking about biomass earlier, uh, and the millions of pieces of media we put in look just like this. And the idea is it's got a lot of surface area given its volume, uh, so we can grow and hold these nitrifiers in the tank. Um, so we've got standard media, might be 550 uh, square meters per cubic meter, up to 850, 1,000 in some cases. We're, we're experimenting and doing some piloting with uh, really high surface area media. And the reason that we're able to go this direction uh, with 4,500, obviously a big step, phase step there, um, because the bacteria that we're growing, the nitrifiers, they don't grow fast, they're really thin, um, and they don't get kind of boogery like a heterotroph does. So this media doesn't always work because these little pores can clog up, but the bacteria we're growing are so small that it's not a problem. And 
Uh, this is important, more, more surface area is important because the more bacteria we can get out there, the more treatment we can get. Um, and the amount of bacteria that are necessary are dependent on temperature. As it gets colder, we require more uh, surface area out there. Um, so we're looking at DeSoto earlier, um, and we'll say the surface area that DeSoto had was around five acres or 167,000 square feet of surface area naturally to nitrify, and it wasn't doing the job. They weren't hitting the limits. They had to do something. Um, so we can replicate all of this surface area right here in an eight by eight cube, about the size of a third of a semi-trailer. If you look, these are semi-trailers. There's five or six right here. We only need a third of one of those to replicate all of that surface area. So we can put a lot of bacteria in a small space. Uh, we do optimize the temperature. Uh, when the temperature dips below that sweet spot, of four to five C, we will warm it back up. Small systems typically with a electric immersion heater, no moving parts, bigger systems with natural gas because natural gas is very uh, cost effective. And this is a radiator type system, it's called a heat exchanger. We just plop this right in the MBBR. And the reason we do concentrated nitrifiers on high surface area media. And the reason we do temperature regulation for a triple point is size. Uh, so this is an evaluation from a facility plan we, uh, we were shared. And the triple point system is right here where we have a few reactors. You can see it fits pretty snugly on, on the site here. Um, because we're dealing with regulated temperature and really tight media, uh, the system could be small. If we're compensating for temperature, and putting in rock, uh, uh, aerated rock filters, the system needs to be significantly larger. In some cases, additional land may need to be required, but if the land's available and it's, it, you've got it, you know, this is how much larger it might be. Um, the other thing that is an important factor to understand with the temperature regulation is we don't always need it, right? We don't need it uh, in the summertime. We just need it for a couple weeks of the year, a couple months of the year, depending on where you are. But what we found actually is that you don't actually need it at all in some applications. And this is because we're all conservative in the wastewater market, right? We're not designing for the wastewater system we have today, the loadings and flows that we have today. We're designing typically for 15, 20, 30 years in the future for some growth condition where industry moves into town, higher flows, higher loadings. And that means we have more surface area on day one than is necessary. And if you recall, these bacteria do consume at really low temperatures down to 1C. Uh, they just do it really slowly, but we're over-designed. We're over capacity out of the gate. And that means the extra surface area can be used to treat the wastewater. Um, so the way that we're, these systems are operating now is that they're, they're paying for the heat when they need it. And that'll be in five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road when the growth is experienced. So instead of compensating for temperature with brute force media uh, or brute force size now, um, paying for all of that equipment now, we say heat the water in the future when you actually need it, pay for it when you need it. And we'll show a case study of this in a little bit here. Um, so we have a bunch of installations. I'm just gonna click through this real quick. Um, typically they're really small. Uh, most lagoon systems are small. These are some nitrox reactors up here. Obviously, aeration is not required. If the BOD is low, you just another look at them. I'm not going to focus too much on these for the sake of time. And I do want to focus on DeSoto, uh, which is a really exciting installation. Uh, we have lots of great data and photo, photos and experience from, from the operators. Okay, move along. So let's talk about DeSoto. Uh, here it is. When we first started talking with them, it was back in 2010. Uh, this is when the nitrox was very new and we had to prove it to the operator. We had to prove it in some senses to ourselves and the IDNR. Uh, the regulators wanted to know that this was going to work. Um, and we worked with them for a couple of years to, to prove the technology. Um, so we put a pilot in and this is when it was first installed, a two tank system, insulated box, water is pulled out of cell two and discharged into cell three. This is when the, the regulators and local operators were, were visiting. And uh, you'll see that the, the temperature of the wastewater changes throughout the year. Um, obviously, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, oh, this is the temperature. Here's the nitrox effluent. The point is we put it in, we kick butt all winter long. The effluent was well below permit, uh, usually below one uh, throughout the first winter, uh, 2010, 2011. So it went forward with design and full system, and you can see it here. Uh, they have two treatment trains, four tanks, 
Uh, this is Iowa specific design um, because they require 50% redundancy. What this means is we have to add an extra concrete wall, but the volume is the same, the media is the same. And uh, the HRT in these tanks is a little bit less than three hours per cell uh, max monthly flow. So here's a top down view. Like I said, here's the extra concrete wall that's required, aeration grid at the bottom, screens to hold in the media. Uh, and this was the photo upon startup. Obviously, we have a, a cover here on top of the reactors. What's exciting about DeSoto is, first of all, it's a good looking facility. And I've got, you know, they have good instrumentation, good panels, a great building there with all the bells and whistles. It's just a really nice looking installation. But what we love about it is the operator really cares. He operates it well. He, he believes that lagoons do it better and he shows it. And we've got great data. So here's the first winner of DeSoto's operation. Like I said, aerated cells. Actually, I noticed fun fun question to ask yourself is where do you think the influent, uh, or from this photo, where do you think the influent comes in? And I noticed that the birds are all right at this aerator and a little bit this aerator. So I'm gonna zoom right about there because that's where the food's coming and they're just gobbling it up. I've noticed that uh, wastewater people are a little bit more hesitant to eat birds when they've seen what they eat. Um, so we put the uh, nitrox reactor in, started it up, and as you can see, BOD, TSS, ammonia were a little bit erratic. They were all normalized immediately afterwards. And this is the first year's data. I'm not going to go through all of it, but I think the important stuff here is the ammonia effluent. Uh, as after we started up, we're talking 0 0.18, 0 0.1, 0 0.15, well below one most of the time, except for these two right here, 8.2 and 5. And the reason that these are asterisks is because this is when, as a part of the project, they were desludging the polishing cell. So they were stirring up all that sludge. And as we discussed, sludge can produce ammonia. And they released all that ammonia when they were desludging. Um, DNR, IDNR didn't care too much about that. That was part of the process. As you can see, when the uh, desludging was complete, the ammonia dropped right back down. So the average in the first winter of operation, just as the bugs were fresh, uh, was 0.4 in the summer and 0.78 in the winter. And this is well below their permit value. But that's not the exciting thing with the Soto. Um, we'll, we'll get there in a second. Um, the next thing we did in that first winter is we were dealt an unexpected stress test. And that was uh, in the term of polar vortex. Nobody saw that coming. Obviously, you can't predict the weather. And it got cold. I think it was as low as negative 20 or negative 22 in Iowa. So one of those super cold days, I think this was negative 15 Fahrenheit, we called the operator and had to I had to probably beg them to get out there in the cold weather. Hey, hey, please take a sample. Please take a sample. We have to see what's going on in kind of the worst case scenario. And on that day, uh, the, effluent, or the ammonia into the nitrox was 15.4 milligrams a liter of ammonia, and the effluent was 0.1 milligram a liter. And that's non-detect from the lab, so that could be 0.03. Um, and we were super excited to see that. At the same time, not, not surprised because we control the temperature. It doesn't matter how cold it gets. If we can control the temperature, we can control nitrification. Uh, the next winter, this past winter, uh, we talked to the operator and went through a regimen of not heating because um, operator, the, well, the two operators, Dan and Nick, um, they realized their flows are much lower today because we're designed for you know, 2035. Um, so let's turn the heat off, utilize our excess capacity or excess surface area and see where we get. And at first we're like, okay, slow down, let's turn it down slowly to four and then 4 or 3.5. And uh, the, the, you know, Dan, Dan and uh, Nick were pretty confident and they just turned it off. Um, so the temperature drop you can see here, it's four and then 1.6 and 0.56 C. I mean, a whole lot colder than 0.56 and it, the water's not moving, it, it's an ice cube. Um, so really cold winter, average temperature of one degree C and the average effluent throughout the winter was 0.18. So really excited to see that uh, they didn't pay a dime for heat all winter long, but they have the heater for the future conditions when they do get higher lows, higher loads or higher flows. Uh, and what we also did too, is we modeled. So this blue line that we had before, you know, we knew the bacteria still ate something in cold weather. We modeled the actual treatment at DeSoto and we found that we were outperforming the the literature, right? This, this is academic literature, 10, 10 different papers, and DeSoto was doing better than they said it should. But we were kind of wondering why. So we looked into it um, and we did a, what's called a microbial community analysis, where essentially you scrape off some bacteria, you send it to a lab, they study the RNA, essentially the DNA, a subcomponent 
of whatever the soup they scrape off is. And they can tell you, I don't know how they read it, they can tell you from that exactly the kinds of bacteria that you're growing in your lagoon. I'm sorry, in your sample. Um, so typically you'd see a ton of heterotrophs. So we got flavobacterium. Um, the trunk line here, the thicker it is, the more bacteria you're growing. What we were excited to see and what we knew we expected to see is that the thickest trunk line, the most bacteria that we have in the system is Nitrosomonas. Um, and we did this at DeSoto and just for a control or another sample, we did it at one of our pilots. We we're testing some new media. Um, and this kind of goes to show that if we optimize the environment, obviously we cater it to nitrifiers, we can grow nitrifiers. It's kind of tautological, I guess. Um, and the lab also told us that the kind of nitrifiers we were growing, the specific subspecies, were cold adapted. Again, kind of makes sense. Um, what was fun about this is that we compared the amount of nitrifiers we were growing to a normal MDBR. How, how much bacteria should a normal MDBR have? Usually between one and 2% of the bacteria are nitrifiers. Um, but because we create the ideal conditions for nitrifiers, we're growing a lot more. At the pilot, we were growing 7%, so more than three times the standard MBBR. At the SOTO, we had 21.6%, so over 10 times the normal MBBR nitrifier population because we cater it to their growth. Um, so that's great. And this is why we can kick butt. Um, at least the SOTO, provided SOTO, was kicking butt all winter long uh, without heat. Um, I'm going to skip this one for the sake of time. We're going on uh, 52 minutes now, and I do want to leave room for questions. Um, a few things we want to I want to kind of go over here at the end. Um, first, we do are we're creating a mobile version here where it can be rolled up and plugged in. This is primarily a industrial service um, where these tanks are rented, the treatments rented, um, uh, but it is something we're we're excited to try on here. Um, and I do want your questions. So I believe there's a method in this this uh, webinar here for you to submit them. Please start doing that now, um, so we don't have too much of a lag later when I go to read those. And then final housekeeping here, kind of a summary. Um, the big takeaway here is you can nitrify in your lagoon. It is something you shouldn't worry about. It is something you can work towards. You can optimize today and plan for tomorrow. Um, and we do believe that lagoons are the best system. Uh, so if you have, a, you know, maybe your buddy at the trade show is saying, oh, you're getting nutrient limits, you're gonna have to go mechanical. You're gonna have to get an activated sludge plant or an SBR or something fancy or complicated. You can just say no. You know we don't we don't have to. That conventional wisdom is not true anymore. Lagoons can nitrify, um, but in order to to get there successfully, you do have to understand your limits. You know when the compliance deadline is, how strict the limits are, when the limits are, um, and then optimize your lagoons for the seven key factors we did discuss, and that'll help you determine the best path forward. And like I said, please reach out to your regulators or rural water. They do have uh, a lot of information, a lot of resources to help you out. Um, obviously, your town's engineer is a great resource as well. They're dealing with this frequently in, in many states, so they're going to be familiar with the ammonia problem. And at any point, you're welcome to reach out to us. Wastewater Lagoons is all we do. Um, we are the experts and uh, happy to share that. I'll say one in three phone calls I have are just answering questions to help somebody out with a problem that we don't really deal with. But we've been around lots of lagoons, and we want to share that. Um, we also have Lagoon University. Uh, which is kind of a goofy name that I love, uh, where we're putting these webinars on to educate uh, operators, engineers, whoever else on their lagoon systems. So there's a whole bunch of webinars shown here. This webinar will be posted there. Um, it is, it's a brand new website. Uh, it's, we're constantly improving it over time. Please visit it. And eventually we will be getting CEUs uh, virtually. And we're working with a number of different states to get those authorized. So please keep checking back. It's lagooniversity.com. Um, and many of you already know this, but we do have the Lagoons to a better community and we welcome you to join. Um, we're putting out blogs every two weeks. We do educational videos. Um, we do a lot of training events, we're not doing those right now because we're locked down, uh, but we do training events throughout the country with uh, Lagoon operator specialists that we bring in to educate. There's a great Facebook community, uh, Lagoons to a better community, where we have hundreds of operators that all share questions and success stories and kind of uh, frustrations with, with Lagoon operations sometimes. And uh, they can really bounce ideas off each other. I've seen some cool things. So it could be everything from what kind of flow you put through your system to a Lagoon's pink, why? Um, great place to go uh, figure that out. And lastly, uh, 
if you go and join our blog and our YouTube page and the Facebook community, we'll send you a hat. The Lagoons do a better hat. If you're kind of, we call them Lagoonatics. If you're a Lagoonatic and you want to wear a mossy oak hat, if Lagoons do it better, we'll send it to you. It's a flex fit. Um, so if you want, want to be a part of that, jump on lagoons.com slash L-D-I-B, Lagoons do it better, and uh, sign up and we'll get you a hat. So questions. Uh, what do we got here? Okay, can expand this thing over here. Please bear with me. Okay, this is difficult to read. Have you been able to nitrify? Yep, so someone's saying they've been able to nitrify in a pond, 22 down to one in one week. Um, that's fantastic. So that, you know, that's a good point. Um, lagoons don't always need something extra to nitrify. Oftentimes, especially in warmer climates, lagoons will nitrify pretty well, you know, down below five, sometimes below, as low as one, two, three milligrams a liter in the summer. Um, this person got it down to one. So that's exciting. Um, you know, a lot of these things that we're talking about here, obviously, are for lagoons that are experiencing those challenges. Sorry, one second, this is difficult to, uh, here we go, I can pop it out, there we go, okay. Yep, someone also had experience with uh, RV discharge, contains formaldehyde, keep that in mind, if you're accepting discharge, you know, know what's in it. Have you considered recycling the air to get the benefit of the heat of the air? Blowers and pressures produce heat. Um, great point, and yes, we absolutely have. Uh, we've analyzed that, and unfortunately, the thermal capacity of air is low, and the thermal needs of the water, the BTU needs, is really high. So the blower air does heat up the water a little bit, um, but it's not super meaningful. It doesn't get as uh, warm as we would like. Uh, have we had any projects in Colorado? Um, I don't believe we have. I need to check with our West Coast uh, West Coast guy, um, but we're always looking for new projects. Most of our projects have currently been in Iowa and Missouri. Those are kind of the two hot spots from a regulation standpoint, uh, where low limits have been applied. They've been there for a few years, um, and towns, you know, hundreds of towns, have been looking at nitrification. How did you manage the sludge produced by the reactor? Do you send it to the sedimentation lagoon? So fun topic, love the question, Umberto. Um, so yes, just to kind of give context here, this is an MBBR and conventional wisdom is that MBBRs produce solids. And that's because those little pieces of media are tumbling around, they're banging into each other, they're banging into the walls. It's a self-cleaning process, which is great because they never clog. Uh, you kind of turn it on, you forget about it for 10 or 20 years. but that does scrape off little pieces of bacteria that need to be settled out. Also, a, a differentiator here is that conventional wisdom comes from the heterotroph world. We're growing those little terminators, they grow fast, they eat fast, which means they slough off fast. They produce lots of solids. Um, we're growing nitrifiers and they grow really slow, so they slough off at a lower rate. So the amount of solids that we produce in our nitrification specific reactor is low. So we're gonna add between two and three milligrams a liter um, and usually that's really fine um, coming in, coming out of the, the MBBR. And a lot of times if there's BOD in the water, we're going to consume that BOD too. Uh, so with BOD reduction comes TSS reduction. So the net, net reduction or addition of TSS across the whole reactor is about equal. What goes in is what comes out. But the other part of your question is, do you put it into the sedimentation lagoon? And yes, we, we do discharge to the polishing cell. So we go cell one, cell two, reactor, polishing cell. And we do that primarily because if cell two burps something up, lagoons turn over, that happens, then it'll go through the reactor and we want to discharge it and settle it out. A couple of these questions are better answered in an email. Kind of specifics about projects. We'll get those out. Um, and yes, can we talk to you in the phone one by one? Uh, absolutely, and that applies to every one of you. My, my number is right here. Uh, I'm, I'm one of the uh, founding members of the company, so I can comment on projects anywhere and, and get you in the right hands. And my email is right here as well, brady at lagoons.com. 
and we are at two o'clock. So it is a one hour webinar and I don't want to take up too, more, too much more of your time. If you're just jonesing for more information, please reach out. Uh, we love to keep you out on the stuff. Um, and if I can't help you, I can point you in the right direction of someone who can. So bradyatlagoons.com and my cell phone is 814-777-3527. And I'm really appreciative of you guys uh, all coming and being on board here. We had a big turnout. I think it was as high as 170 or so. So we're excited about that. Glad to see you all here and uh, hope you all have a wonderful rest of your Thursday. Thank you.